Okay, so set. Now we just need to remove one little box from the screen. Okay. Okay, ready for launch. <laughs> um, thank you. I hope uh, you have enjoyed a good lunch with a good wine. Um, Stephen and Herku are missing definitely something. Um, I would like to now introduce the afternoon of this first day of our IG Europe Experience Day. The entire afternoon is uh, international. So it means we have our speakers uh, virtual because they come from different parts of the globe. We have uh, uh, US here, we have Latin America here, we have uh, Asia. Um, and I would uh, first uh, like to introduce the first slot of this session which is the keynote speech around the Global Digital Health Partnership. And it will be brought to you by um, Stephen Posnack, who you just see on the screen. Hi, Stephen. Stephen is the Deputy National Coordinator for Health Information Technology uh, in the US. And uh, his counterpart is uh, Herko Komans who is uh, part of the uh, Netherlands Ministry of Health, uh, Welfare and Sports, I think, right? Correct. Uh, Herko, could you say hello so that we see your face? Hello. Ah, this is Herko. <laughs> you know, it's the Zoom mechanics. So thank you, Stephen and Herko, um, for uh, your uh, interesting presentation. And I just give you the floor. Thank you very much. All right, so this is Steve here. Thank you very much for having us. And um, I'm on a panel later this afternoon for you. So uh, it will be my fault and somewhat Herco's, but mostly me if we uh, become more delayed. So um, we have a lot of content to cover with you. I uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to address you today. I uh, wish I could be there. Sounds like a uh, delightful event. Um, but by the power of the internet, we are here and joining you. So um, as, as Jürgen mentioned, uh, we are both here today representing uh, the Global Digital Health Partnership. I'm going to cover uh, a bit of it as an overview, as well as uh, dive a little bit deeply into the um, work that we're doing on the interoperability side, which I know many of you uh, will be interested in. So we can go to the next slide. The um, GDHP is, is really a, a connection among many of the government digital health leaders across the, uh, across the world. And as Jürgen mentioned, uh, the United States serves as the chair for 2022 and 2023. So my uh, chairmanship on behalf of the U.S. is slowly uh, coming to an end, or quickly coming to an end, I guess you'd say. And uh, the Netherlands will be taking over as the, the chair, currently serving in the vice chair role, uh, starting in 2024. Um, I'm not going to read all of the various bits and pieces of every slide that we have here because, as I mentioned, we have a lot of content to cover with you in about 30 minutes. Uh, but we are growing, um, and uh, we have about 35 members, including uh, various around the globe. And uh, we can go to the next slide. In case you're interested in checking out more information about GDHP, we have relaunched a formal website. Uh, you can find more um any of the publicly available information that we've made that I'm going to cover with you today is accessible at gdhp.health. Uh, you can look at the membership. If you see um, that your Ministry of Health is not represented, you can certainly let them know uh, to get in touch with either myself or Herco uh, to um, begin that conversation around uh, joining the GDHP as well. So we can go to the next slide, which is just to show you an image of the, uh, the globe here. And uh, to let you know that we're, you know, well represented across many of the continents in uh, around the world. And um, as many of you know, I'm assuming engaging in IIT activities. It's not the technical interoperability issues that cause the most problems. It's time zones, and uh, we do our best to resolve a lot of those, uh, as evidenced by you know us joining at various different times in the day with you all too. Uh, we can go to the next slide, and you can actually double tap. Uh, so we have a number of work streams. Uh, five in particular. Um, I'll, I won't cover the, the, the details here, but they do cover the normal um, topic areas that you would expect. Uh, these are places where the digital health leads within each of the ministries of health get together. 
uh, share best practices, as one of my initial slides uh, indicated, as well as, as put together work plans for particular areas in which uh, we seek to make uh, collaborative progress, cumulative progress, and um, you know, develop strategies that are uh, applicable across our different governments and across our different health systems. Um, I'm sure for many of you that have uh, engaged internationally, while the payment model may be different, while some of the interoperability choices may be different, the problems that we are largely trying to accomplish are pretty much the same for the citizens and the populations that we serve. And so we find a lot of commonality despite our differences uh, across these GDHP work streams. Uh, you can go to the next slide. We are uh, well represented, again, across the globe um, from a diversity perspective. Each of the work streams has a chair and co-chair uh, that help to lead the work. And um, those are the folks on the daily basis that are handling those, those time zone challenges in addition to uh, keeping everyone organized and, and marching through uh, various different yearly uh, plans and strategies. Uh, you can go to the next slide. We have produced, and um, these are getting a little bit old, but they're still, I think, pretty relevant in terms of the, the challenges that governments face in the Ministries of Health. A number of white papers for each of the work streams were part of the initial formulation of GDHP, and some of them have been updated by uh, the um, specific work streams over time as well. So if you're interested in, in digging into a little bit more deeply the, um, the work that each of the work streams have done, there are some uh, uh, artifacts available now to you at this stage as well. But um, as the chair, we can go to the next slide, I wanted to uh, let you know that we are working on a patient engagement project. And um, that will it, include a number of different factors or dimensions in which we're uh, working to drop to the next slide, Herco. Um, Herco's trying to keep pace with me, and then he's going to have to keep pace with himself as he uh, drives his own slides in a minute. Uh, so, um, all of us know uh, across our jurisdiction that um, engaging our population, getting access to our own health information is really important in terms of being able to manage our care, serving as a caregiver. And there are a lot of uh, different policies, laws, technical, technical approaches that um, each of the GDHP members has, some of which have been very successful, some of which are more mature than others. And so we're looking at this as an opportunity as uh, part of the, the US chair uh, for GDHP to put together and, and create a kind of cumulative artifact that we can use to help advise the GDHP members uh, around their patient engagement. Um, this is something that at least right now we're, we have focused as an internal work product, but we're also um, intending to make something publicly available uh, for this work too. Go to the next slide. Uh, so today, like many of you, I uh, wear many hats and um, I am also the uh, co-chair for the interoperability work stream. And that has uh, a number of things that myself and Herco will be uh, talking to you about. So the first one is around something that we call the Global Observatory of eHealth Standards. It's really the, the indexing of uh, a number of different uh, standards and how they apply to use cases. And so you'd be of no surprise that IET-related specifications across our GHP members are uh, well represented. You can go over to the, the next slide here. I know this is not going to be easy to see uh, unless you have a, a very large, um, you know, screen. But um, just as a, a, an illustration, we are looking across all of these uh, different use cases and mapping them at a pretty detailed level for each um, GDHP member where they're indicating their particular usage. And so that helps us uh, better understand where there are peers across the GDHP membership that have implemented standards that may be advancing to a particular uh, direction. And um, equally, you can go to the next slide, we can look at certain trends that are um, starting to emerge as we do this on uh, a periodic basis. And so we're starting to be able to compare CDHP usage trends from the first time that we did it in, 2020, in 2019 to now in 2023. And um, you know, this is a statistically significant sample, but it does get to you know, give you a sense of where there's a little bit of a trending here and there. Um, you know, obviously, your know, fire, uh, HL7 fire is, is definitely taking a greater foothold in uh, a number of areas. And um, you know, we can see things uh, change over time. The other uh, pl place where we're working is to uh, get a better sense of the overall interoperability associated in GDHP members' jurisdictions too. And so, we're looking at trying to, to create a way for, um, you know, as mentioned here on the slide, 
you know, tool for our members to assess their overall interoperability progress and um, get a better sense of where they can compare and contrast their interoperability experiences. So uh, without um, going too much into uh, more of uh, Herco's slides here, I'm going to turn it over to him to uh, begin the conversation on the inter International Patient Summer. Yes, and uh, thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you for having us uh, to talk about uh, GDHP. What makes the GDHP really interesting to us, I think it's that it's a group of national digital health authorities. So we are all facing the same kinds of issues and problems and challenges, and we all have the same kind of instruments like uh, um, investment packages, uh, legislation, all kinds of government incentives that we can use um, to advance interoperability. So the fact that we can work together in, first of all, um, sharing our experience in, in how are we uh, dealing with all these challenges and then starting to align our policies and our instruments uh, at an international level. And then maybe even, especially in interoperability, we keep moving towards more and more of an insight into where do we think that we need to harmonize things at the, at the policy um, level so that we're actually uh, pushing the needle forward on interoperability at the global scale. And one of the big best examples in this, and this is why it's been um, uh, big in the news, I think, is the International Patient Summary. Um, and I assume that everyone is already aware at the IAT level, at least, um, what the IPS is. It's the patient summary, so it doesn't have all the information. It's not a longitudinal health record, but it does have uh, information about medications, allergies, problems, um, uh, immunizations, results, uh, and procedures. And what makes the IPS interesting to us is that it's not just one standard developed by one SDO, but it's um, a set of, well, technically you call them artifacts, uh, that are being kept aligned together uh, so it's the IHC profile, it's the HL7 CDA ID and the FIRE ID, uh, it's the SNOMED uh, refer reference set, it's the ISO information model, um, and it's all being kept aligned within the, the JIC working group uh, uh, that's working on this. Um, and because this works so well as, uh, um, as a set of standards, you see that it's now becoming more and more a truly global standard with worldwide adoption that is growing. In 2021, the G7 under the UK chairmanship said that they want to encourage the widest possible adoption of standards and greater interoperability, which for the G7 um, at that level to address this issue was, uh, was a first. Um, and they asked the GDHP to, um, to work with the G7 to achieve this goal. So, Already in 2021, we saw that this group of collaborating national authorities together with the WHO and the OECD and uh, IDARE, the International Institute for AI in uh, Health Research, um, that, that collaboration is already a place where organizations like the G7 uh, look to, um, uh, to take the lead in global interoperability. Another big step for the IPS is that the World Health Organization has launched the Global Digital Health Certification Network, which is where part of the, um, the European um, travel QR code work has gone into. Um, that also supports a global exchange of uh, IPS messages. So what does the GDHP do with the IPS? So, we focus now on patient-mediated exchange, uh, which is the use case that uh, allows us to do a lot without having to dive into all the privacy implications and the legal requirements for that. Um, and what we do as a, a GDHP group is that we um, uh, we host mini connectathons, which are for our virtual events, and we've had quite a few of those. And in that, we test if IPS messages can be sent between uh, different countries cross uh, border. Uh, many countries also use this uh, connectathon to test them, uh, to test a local IPS uh, exchange or patient summary exchange across 
not international borders, but national borders or organizational borders. So it's not just uh, for international um, exchange. Uh, and also we, we consider next to the technical implications um, of implementing the IPS, we also consider the policy implications and what does this mean for our incentives and our uh, guidance that we need to give within our jurisdictions. Uh, we also involve uh, um, vendors in this process. Uh, you can see some uh, vendors here that uh, we uh, work with. It's not that we make um, uh, that we sign contracts with them, um, but we want to show that it's possible and we want to ensure that it actually works in practice and not just um, as a policy initiative. Like Steve said, there's also other um, work streams that we are working on, even though I think that um, uh, you would be most interested in the work in the interoperability work stream that Steve leads, which of course is very good. Um, but we also do um, work on how do we as um, uh, national authorities, um, how do we work together and engage uh, the professionals, the healthcare professionals and our citizens or health consumers. And here you can see some of the, the semantic um, differences between uh, countries where some call them very much a citizen in that role and others call them consumers in, in that role. Um, but we all mean uh, the same thing there. So one of the topics that we are looking into there is digital health literacy. So how can we advance um, the capabilities within our countries and our regions um, to advance the uptake of digital health technologies, both in the professionals uh, population as well as in the general population um, but also how can we uh, develop guidelines that make the technology more accessible uh, for all users uh, because our goal of course is to make these um, technologies available to everyone. Uh, so this is very much uh, uh, focused on building capacity by first getting insight in uh, where are we at, um, what are the tools that we have already developed within our own jurisdictions and what can we learn from those tools and how can we share those resources across the membership group? Another one is that we can develop a lot of policies, but how do we know if they work? This was from the start a very big question um, within the group. Uh, and we also found that everyone had their own way of, of measuring their own success or not measuring their own success even. Um, uh, as is usual uh, in a political environment. It's not always um, welcome to measure the outcome. But we do think that it's very important for these uh, uh, digital health uh, uh, interventions to know whether or not they are effective. Uh, and this is probably our most scientific uh, work stream. Uh, and they've written a scientific paper on where the digital health priorities within the, the membership of the GDHP are and um, um, if there is any, any uh, overlap in that that we can see as, uh, as a guiding principle. Another one that they were uh, focused on is cross-border telehealth because um, this is very much accumulation of, of that uh, uh, clinician and consumer engagement process where it all comes together is in, um, in telehealth services and how do we get those available across borders and what are the uh, incentives and uh, the frameworks that we need to get in place for that. And um, the third paper that they've written is about the uh, user acceptance. So how um, many of all those uh, amazing products and services that have been developed and are being deployed um, what is the view, the general view of, of the public uh, to, those, um, uh, to those interventions. Like I said, we are all government organizations or uh, government mandated organizations. So we also look at how do we um, uh, share what our policy is. And one of the things that we're now working on is what we call the policy reference desktop, which is sort of an overview of um, all the different 
policy initiatives that we have. So these are national strategies for interoperability, for data availability, for exchange platforms, um, uh, for um, standards development, for all these kinds of um, uh, digital health um, infrastructures uh, at the national uh, or regional level. Um, and these look at how do we fund, what are the funding schemes for these? Um, uh, uh, what are our incentive schemes for unlocking the data? Do we um, uh, build our own platforms and services or uh, do we procure them? And what are the, the requirements we set for that procurement? Uh, how do we take into account how we develop the capabilities within the workforce? Uh, like I said, the digital literacy. Um, so these are all uh, aspects that we look at and that we now uh, are um, uh, putting into a big overview so that we have um, uh, a sort of a starting point that if we want to develop a new strategy, we can see what's already out there and it will help greatly into, into finding out where we can have uh, international collaborations. Um, so like I said, these are about technical requirements, but also about like transformation enablers like funding or regulation um and how do we engage the whole ecosystem the final work stream that we are presenting here is the cybersecurity work stream which of course is also a very uh, current topic um, and it's very interesting because it's all about trust in this um, uh, in this work stream so there's three things that um, uh, that we've already started working on towards a global digital health security by design toolkit. So it's all um, focused on providing the capabilities and the learnings to the GDHP members into uh, building their own capacity. Uh, we already have an, uh, a, a medical device manufacturer, Internet of Things code of conduct, uh, we also try not to duplicate a lot of the work that's being done in all the other uh, international forums and, and uh, organizations and try to find where can we bring things together and make them applicable and um, uh, usable for the GDHP members at that policy and uh, national authority level. We're currently working on the model security notice, which is uh, sort of like a... a, a an energy label or um, uh, a nutrition label for um, uh, cybersecurity uh, behavior and uh, of digital health services. And that will lead towards a labeling schema that we hope to, um, uh, to make as formal as we can. Uh, the model security notice will be a, voluntarily, a voluntary openly available resource, uh, which will show um, how secure a product is and how they uh, control the security, uh, which will help us make better choices, both consumers, but also um, uh, healthcare procurers can then uh, use these uh, security notices as, um, um, as a guidance to, um, to procure safe and secure uh, health service. And it will be in plain language uh, so everyone can be informed. Uh, it looks at things like access control, data encryption, but not just the technical part, but also the organizational security policies. Uh, how do they deal with, uh, with breaches and uh, do they have the protocols needed to do that? Uh, do they have um, um, uh, the, the proper a risk management methodology implemented and all those kinds of things. Um, these are all work streams that are being um, resourced by these government organizations and where, uh, where necessary we invite other partners to join us uh, like in those mini connectathons on the IPS uh, where we have several non-governmental organizations and uh, partners uh, engaged as well. Uh, but it is, as a membership, it is strictly uh, uh, for that national authority um, uh, or international organization with um, 
uh, in, with national authority members. Um, uh, so that's where the WHO and OECD uh, uh, fit in. Um, and it is being resourced by uh, people from our own organizations. Um, it is still a voluntary uh, collaboration, but because we're all in the same boat, if you will, it means that we are all um, very engaged in these topics, both because it's a very, very fun group of people to be amongst, and I can say that from the bottom of my heart, uh, but also because um, we're all in this together and we're and if we get out of these calls or back from these um, summits that we host twice a year, um, then it's the same topic and the same challenges that we work on within our jurisdiction. So it's immediately applicable in our daily jobs um, as well. And that makes it very, very valuable to us all. And I'm not telling you that because it's sort of like a, an elite closed society with a secret handshake. Although, Steve, I do think we need a secret handshake. Um, but that we are open to engage with every one of you. And that's one of the reasons why we are uh, part of this IHE uh, uh, event, of course. Um, and you can reach out to that uh, using the email address uh, of the Secretariat. Uh, and there's ways to connect with us uh, and to find all our information and our products that we already have published at the website. And I think I have left 10 seconds of our time. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen and Herko, uh, for this kind presentation. And uh, I'm privileged to represent Austria in this initiative and can safely say that it's really a pleasure to work under the leadership of US, executed by Stephen, I want to mention. And we are looking forward to a smooth handover to the Netherlands. So thanks again, and please a round of applause.